Hallelujah and blessings in King Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Be Ye Holy Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say with hearts of praise and adoration, Hallelujah. Well, friends, it is such a delight and joy to be back with you. I trust that you are walking faithfully in your journey with Jesus, that you're growing in his spirit, in his likeness each and every day, and that you're hungering and thirsting after the things of God and for the word of God. Well, we're continuing our study in the book, Love Not the World, and today we're going to be in chapter 5. So without further ado, let's just jump straight into what the Lord has to teach us and discover what it is the Lord would have us to learn from Watchman Nee through his book, again, Love Not the World. Chapter 5 is entitled, Distinctiveness. May I now invite your attention to words Jesus addressed to the Jews in John 8, 23. Ye are from beneath. I am from above. Ye are of this world. I am not of this world. I wish us to note especially here the use of the words from and of. The Greek word in each case is ek, E-K, which means out of and implies origin. Ek to kosmu is the expression used. From or of or out of this world. So the sense of this passage is, your place of origin is beneath. My place of origin is above. Your place of origin is in this world. My place of origin is not of this world. The question is not, are you a good or bad person? But rather, what is your place of origin? We do not ask, is this thing right, or is that thing wrong, but where did it originate? It is origin that determines everything. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. So when Jesus turns to his disciples, he can say using the same Greek preposition, if ye were of this world, ek tu kosmu, the world would love its own. But because you are not of this world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. You'll find this in John 15, 19. Here we have the same expression, not of the world. But in addition, we have another and more forceful expression. When Jesus says, I chose you out of the world. In this latter instance, there is a double emphasis. As before, there is an ek, which again means out of. But in addition to this verb chose from eklogomai, itself contains another ek. Jesus is saying that his disciples have been chosen out of the world. There is this double ek in the life of every believer. Out of that vast organization called the cosmos, out of all the great mass of individuals belonging to it and involved in it, out, clean out of all that, God has called us. Thence comes the title Ecclesia, God's called out ones, the church, the elect. From the midst of the great cosmos, God calls one here and one there, and all whom he calls, he calls out. There is no such thing as a call from God that is not a call out of the world. The church is ecclesia. In the divine intention, there is no ecclesia which lacks the ek. If you are a called one, then you are a called out one. If God has called you at all, then he has called you to live in the spirit 
outside the world system. Originally, we were in that satanic system with no way of escape, but we were called, and that calling brought us out. True, that statement is a negative one, but there is a positive side also to our Constitution. For as the people of God, we have two titles, each of them significant according to the way that we view ourselves. If we look back at our past history, we are ecclesia, the church. But if we look to our present life in God, we are the body of Christ, the expression on earth of him who is in heaven. From the standpoint of God's choice of us, we are out of the world. But from the standpoint of our new life, we are not of the world at all, but we are from above. On the one hand, we are a chosen people, called and delivered out of the world system. On the other, we are a regenerate people, utterly unrelated to that system, because by the Spirit, we are born from above. So John sees the holy city coming down out of heaven from God in Revelation 21.10. As the people of God, heaven is not only our destiny, but it is our origin. Now this is an amazing thing, that in you and me, there is an element that is essentially otherworldly. So otherworldly is it indeed that no matter how this world may progress, it can never advance one step in likeness to that. The life we have as God's gift came from heaven and never was in the world at all. It has no correspondence with the world, but is in perfect correspondence with heaven. And though we must mingle with the world daily, it will never let us settle down and feel at home here. Let us consider for a moment this divine gift, this life of Christ indwelling the heart of a regenerate man. The Apostle Paul has a great deal to say about this. In an illuminating passage in 1 Corinthians, he makes a striking twofold statement. First, he says that God himself has placed us in Christ. And second, he says that Christ has been made unto us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. This is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. Here are examples of the whole range of human need that God has met in his Son. We have shown elsewhere how God does not distribute to us these qualities of righteousness, holiness, and so on in installments to be taken as required. What he does is to give us Christ as the inclusive answer to all of our needs. He makes his son Jesus to be our righteousness and our holiness and everything else we lack on the ground that he has already placed us in Jesus Christ crucified and risen. Now I would draw your attention to the last word, redemption. For redemption has a great deal to do with the world. The Israelites, you will recall, were redeemed out of Egypt, which at that time was all the world they knew, and which is for us a figure of this world under satanic rule. I am Jehovah, God said to Israel, and I will redeem you with a stretched out arm. So God brought them out of Egypt setting a barrier of judgment between them and Pharaoh's pursuing host, so that Moses could sing of Israel as the people which thou hast redeemed. You'll read about this in Exodus chapter 6, verse 6, and chapter 15, verse 13. Now, in the light of this, let us now take Paul's double statement. If God has placed us in Christ, as Paul tells us, then since Christ is altogether out of the world, we too are altogether out of the world. He is now our sphere, and being in him, we are by definition 
out of that other sphere. The Father, Paul tells us, delivered us out of the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have our redemption. Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. This transfer was the subject of our last two chapters. Furthermore, if also Christ is made unto us redemption, if that is to say he is given to us to be that, then that means that within us, God has set Christ himself as the barrier to resist the world. I have met many young Christians trying to resist the world, trying in one way or another to live an unworldly life. They found it very hard, and moreover, such effort is, of course, wholly unnecessary. For by his own essential otherness, that is Jesus's, Christ is our barrier to the world, and we need nothing more. It is not that we must do anything in relation to our redemption, any more than the people of Israel did anything in relation to theirs. They simply trusted in God's redeeming arm outstretched on their behalf. And Christ is made to us redemption. In our heart, there is a barrier set up between us and this world, the barrier of another kind of life, namely that of the Lord himself. And God has set the barrier there. Because of Christ, the world cannot reach us. Therefore, what need have we to try either to resist or to escape the system of the things of this world? If we look within ourselves, for something which to meet and overcome the world, we instantly find everything within us crying out for that world. While if we struggle to detach ourselves from the world, we simply become more and more involved. But let the day once come when we recognize that within us, Christ is our redemption and that in him we are all together out. That day will see the end of struggling. We shall simply tell Jesus that we can do nothing at all about this world's business, but instead we will thank him and with all our hearts, we will say that he is our redeemer. At risk of monotony, let me say again, the character of the world is morally different from the spirit imparted life we have received from God. Fundamentally, it is because we possess this new life of God's gift that the world hates us, for it has no hatred for its own kind. This radical difference leaves us indeed with no way of making the world love us. For Jesus told us in John 15, 19, if you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, therefore the world hates you. When the world meets in us a natural human honesty and decency, it appreciates this, and it is ready to pay us due respect and place in us its confidence. But as soon as it meets that in us which is not of ourselves, namely the divine nature of which we have been made partakers, its hostility is at once aroused. Show the world the fruits of Christianity, and it will applaud. Show it Christianity, and it will oppose it vigorously. Let me say that again. Show the world the fruits of Christianity, and it will applaud. Show it Christianity, and it will oppose it vigorously. For let the world evolve as it will. It can never produce one Christian. It can imitate Christian honesty, Christian courtesy, Christian charity, yes, but to produce one single Christian, it can never aspire. A so-called Christian civilization gains the recognition and respect of the world. The world can tolerate that. It can even assimilate and utilize that. But Christian life, 
The life of Jesus in the Christian believer, that it hates. And wherever it meets it, it will assuredly oppose it to the death. Christian civilization is the outcome of an attempt to reconcile the world and Christ. In Old Testament figures, we see that represented by Moab and Ammon, the fruit indirectly of Lot's involvement and compromise with Sodom. And neither Moab nor Ammon proved any less hostile to Israel than were the heathen nations. Christian civilization proves that it can mix with the world and may even be found taking the world's side in a crisis. There is one thing, however, that is eternally apart from the world and can never mix with it, and that is the life of Jesus. Their natures are mutually antagonistic and cannot be reconciled. Between the finest specimen of human nature the world can produce and the most insignificant Christian, there is no common ground, and thus there is no basis of comparison. For natural goodness is something we had by natural birth and can by our own resources naturally develop. But spiritual goodness is, in John's words, begotten of God. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. God has established in the world a universal church. And in one place and another, he has planted many local churches. God, I say, has done this. It would be unreasonable, therefore, to expect that his way of deliverance from the world would be by physical separation from it. But as a consequence, many sincere Christians are greatly perplexed by the problem of absorption. If God plants a local church here, will it, they ask, one day be reabsorbed by the world? That, in fact, presents no problem to the living God. Inasmuch as its origin is not of the world, there is in the family of God no correspondence whatever with the world, and thus no possibility of the world absorbing it. There is, of course, no credit to us, his children. It is not because we earnestly desire to be heavenly that the church is heavenly, but because we are born out of heaven. And if by our heavenly origin we are absolved from trying to work our way there, we are absolved also thereby from studying to keep ourselves physically clear of this world. How can the world possibly mix with what is otherworldly? For all that is of the world is empty dust, whereas all that is of God has the miraculous quality of divine life. Some of our brothers in Nanking were once assisting in relief work after the bombing of the city by Japanese planes. Suddenly, as they stood before a shattered house wondering where to begin, there was a violent upheaval of bricks and timbers, and a man emerged. Shaking the dust and rubble from him, he rose and struggled to his feet. The fallen beams and rafters fell back into place behind him, and the dust settled again. But out he walked alive. While there is life, what fear is there of mixture? The prayer of Jesus to his Father, which John records in John chapter 17, contains a plea that is most arresting. Having repeated the statement that the world hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world, Jesus continues by saying, I pray not that thou shouldest take them from Ek out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from Ek, the evil one. John 17 verses 14 and 15. Here we have an important principle which will occupy our next chapter. Christians have a vital place in the world. Though saved from the evil one and his system, they have not yet been removed from his territory. They have a part to play there for which they are indispensable. Religious people, as we saw, 
attempt to overcome the world by getting out of it. As Christians, that is not our attitude at all. Right here is the place where we are called to overcome. Created distinct from the world, we accept with joy, exhilarating heavenly joy, the fact that God has placed us in the world. That distinctiveness, our gift from God in Christ, is all the safeguard we need. And with that, we come to the end of chapter 5. Now, I will admit, on the first reading of this chapter, it may be hard to understand or fully comprehend, so I would encourage you to go back and re-listen to the chapter again and allow the truth of what the Spirit of Christ is trying to teach us here fully absorb our hearts and souls so that we can become the true followers of Jesus we so long to be and that we can again live in this world but not of this world. Now, as the Lord wills, and until next time, friends, I truly love you. I pray that the Lord Jesus will guide you each and every step of your day, and that you will become hungry for the things of God, thirsting after his righteousness, his holiness, and his godliness. Now, until we meet again on the next video, may the Lord keep you and bless you, and may you walk in the fullness of his grace and truth.